Hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Gerber, Chair of Science Communication here in NRW, Germany. My comments today are based on a number of international research projects we have conducted about responsible research and social innovation. Well, first, I'd like to spare you the historic excursion as to what science communication, SciComm, classically stood for and why it apparently has so little to do with technology assessment, which is quite an irritating and, and, and anachronistic misunderstanding, in my humble opinion. Instead, I'd like to discuss how both fields can <clears throat> and already do enrich one another. In fact, SciComm today should and, and largely already is so much more than journalism and press releases, science shows and exhibitions. There's um, a very long list of parallels between SACOM and TA, technology assessment. Parallels that can easily be embraced as, as learning opportunities by both sides. Take the participatory turn um, by Describe by Jasanov in 2003, for example, and um, the almost simultaneous trend towards a more upstream public engagement in SciComm. In both ways, we're now today struggling enormously to reconcile these different expectations which participants then have. While an NGO may expect more transparency and influence, a stakeholder from industry may often just hope to increase their legitimacy, while policymakers should or could mainly seek justification for delegating that responsibility for certain decisions, or at least uh, to for justifying those decisions more easily. And in the middle of all this messy situation is the science communicator and or, or the TA practitioner. So I'm asking myself, what is actually the difference between A, trying to gain a more con context sensitive socially robust understanding of a given certain socio-technical issue by means of deliberative processes such as town hall meetings, focus groups, and so on. <clears throat> uh, and B, the attempt in SciComm to resolve those controversies with very similar participatory methodologies. The only difference to me seems to be the objective why to engage stakeholders, not really how we do it. So the underlying question remains the same. What Ulrike Feld called the epistemic concern as to um, how we can obtain an, quote, adequate blend of knowledge and experience. Whether people and politicians consider the assessment of technology, technology assessment to be more of a responsible early warning system, or rather an obstructive process that always sees the glass half empty. The question how the public and politics perceive TA is after all primarily a question of communication. It simply doesn't suffice anymore, if it has ever has, for TA to study the mere um, carbon footprint and determine it to calculate the opportunity costs of not internalizing externalities or something like that. In the end, Pilke's honest broker requires both the honesty of an objective analysis and the intermediary function of brokering between those different positions. I think that most of the major changes in the discipline are once again directly connected to communication. And let me maybe try to illustrate it with two points. First one, if we look at what's always been at the heart of TA throughout the decades, it is the aim to contextualize a given technology in how it could or already does affect people, planet and profits. And that's exactly what SICOM good SICOM is also meant to achieve, to help people put technological progress into a much wider systemic picture. Most clearly, our integrated view of sustainability nowadays comes to mind to both as, again, assess and communicate which uses of a given technology are socially sustainable, environmentally, economically, and not least culturally sustainable. Yet each and every one 
of the most recent sustainability models, first and foremost, builds on communication. So planetary boundaries, donut economy, the Anthropocene, degrowth, even John Elkington's green swans, the well-being economy even explicitly includes its own narrative initiative. And that's the second point, maybe the most obvious link between those two areas, Psychom and TA, is how we deal with risk. It's commonplace that there's always a risk when communicating about risk, which is why it needs an evidence-based systematic approach to do that. So from an analytical TA perspective, in fact, a fact is basically a fact is a fact is a fact. Communication could help us to distinguish here at least between, let's say, three different kinds of risks. The first one, the known and the limited risks, the ones that may we, we could contain by changing behavior. So making sure that consumers understand that uh, burnt carbs in the toast or their French fries they eat increases the intake of acrylamide and thereby um, certain health risks and essentially empower them to make informed decisions. The second category of risk is, are the unknown ones with high, highly uncertain evidence. These literally wicked problems in today's post-normal world of science. Here we can only disclose transparently what we know and what we don't know, which already makes communication so much more complex. But the biggest challenge is the third one. And those are the risks where public concerns diverge significantly from the scientific evidence, entering the emotional minefield of conspiracy theories and cherry-picked arguments, for example, regarding the climate crisis or GMOs. Fortunately, again, there's an evidence-based risk and crisis communication body of evidence that we have at our hands, providing the expertise and the experience necessary to deal with each of these three types of risks. Let me start with the more rhetorical question whether science and its communication are actually political. Epistemological speaking, research generates knowledge, whereby it inevitably either supports or threatens certain opinions, and thereby also affects vested interests. Hence, the inherently political nature of the scientific enterprise by definition. To give you three examples what that means for the common side, first take the advisory work of academies of science, purely political communication. Secondly, the advocacy work of CSOs and NGOs. And thirdly, the science diplomacy work by governmental institutions and learned societies. So my own future outlook would be that there is this one major concern that colleagues in both research and practice of either SICOM and TA share, and something that is also shared as an expectation by the research funding authorities and the science policymakers themselves, and that is social inclusion. Because either for reaching a more diverse set of target groups at a public engagement event to be less elitist in terms of communication, or when on the research side, on the TA side, when drawing a sample for a survey, the need to increase not only the demographic proportionality, but also this discursive representation of different viewpoints. So both our analysis in TA and our outreach in SciComm are supposed to minimize the risk of groupthink, let alone any form of active suppression of marginalized positions, which if we're honest, and if we look into the evaluation is something that happens on a regular basis. This will be the ultimate challenge of this decade to be more socially inclusive and diverse about the perspectives we analyze and the perspectives we convey. Addressing that challenge will most definitely be more effective if PSYCOM and TA get better at learning from one another.